So I, I don't even know how to start this. I know we kind of got into it a little bit. We had a fun meeting. We had Carrie jump in. So. Yeah, my <laughs> guest for tomorrow jumps in. <laughs> anyway, I might tell that. I'll tell that story tomorrow. That'd be better. Yeah. Or, or I love it. Next episode. Next episode. With, Tune with, in because Carrie. Carrie is a hoot and I love her. <laughs> yes. So Emily Prokop is here. By the way, is that how you pronounce your last name? Yes, it is. It okay. Is. And Prokop. I wanted to ask you, it's good that I ask you on the air. Um, <laughs> of course, I probably could edit it out, but I won't. Um, so I, I thought of your name, Prokop, and I thought um, when it comes to uh, police officers versus bad guys, I guess you're Prokop. Oh, come on! Uh, you know, the yeah. funny thing oh, is... It just, <laughs> I mean, come on, people. Comedy. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> When I met my husband for the first time, we met in college, and I heard his name, and I made the same exact joke. And I didn't realize at the time because I thought I was really clever. And at that point, he was maybe 20. And he's like, yep, never heard that before. And now oh, I get yeah. the last name, too, so I get it, too. But what's funny is nobody knows how to pronounce it. They're like, Prokop? And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. Who's that? Yeah. All right. And it was funny. I, I, I realized on my show, I was like, a lot of my listeners, even though I say my name every single episode, they don't know how to pronounce it. And Spellcheck likes to change it to pork chop. So I was like, <laughs> well, let's see what happens if you uh, Google Emily pork chop. Boom, my book comes up. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see if Emily Pro Cop pork chop can, can grunt yeah. along with our intro. This is the true test of a guest. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're done. We're done. That's it. Emily, did you all hear that? I can't believe it. Oh, my God. Well, we really do have to start a show. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us on the Podcast Engineering Show. I'm so happy you're here. This is the show where we talk about podcast production, all the technical aspects, the hardware, the software. I have a background in audio engineering in the music business. And since I entered podcasting about well seven or eight years ago now, I noticed a huge lack of audio skills in podcasting. And so, uh, anyway, this show can help you. It can help you sound better. And if you implement the best of what you learn here, your podcast will sound a lot better, and you'll spend less time producing them, which is awesome because time is money, as everyone knows. And, of course, Podcast Engineering School, the next semester, is starting soon. So I'm recording this uh, episode with Emily so far in advance, well not so far, maybe like a month and a half, maybe two months, that I don't know what semester's coming next by the time this comes out. <laughs> so anyway, we do semesters every quarter. Podcast Engineering School, you can get a get a really good deal if you if you if you get in early. So check out the website podcastengineeringschool.com. Barry's here with me. Oh forget it. Barry, Emily's here. Oh forget it. Emily Prokop. Oh, forget I'm it. I'm telling you. That's right. So Emily is the host of, uh, you already know this, the story behind yeah. podcast. The story behind. If you're not subscribed to her show, turn off this show. <laughs> Search <laughs> well, for her show. <laughs> Wait, did I just tell all my listeners to go away? <laughs> no. No, 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 pause it. Come back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, in in most podcasting apps, you can subscribe to a show while you're listening to another. So, oh, that's there true. You See, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you're also a podcast editor. Uh, be uh, you know, in addition to hosting your great show, which it really is a great show. Everybody, check it out. You're a consultant as well for podcast uh, clients and launches and all that. And you're also the author of the story behind the extraordinary yeah. history behind ordinary objects, which is a book. Based on your podcast, right? I know. How cool is that? So oh. podcasters, that happens. It's awesome. And if you script your show, you basically have a book already written. Uh, prediction time, everybody. Put on your prediction hats. I'm going to put mine on. You know what happened with Aaron Mankey and Lore? You all know what happened? Remember, he got signed to Amazon Prime. He's done two seasons of Amazon Prime. Like, like It's like a TV show, Lore, yeah. right? Yeah. Big deal. Huge deal. That's going to happen to Emily. I'm calling it right now. Good. That's a good call because I'm actually in talks with somebody about making it a TV show. So. I'm a genius. You are. You are a genius. All right. All right. Now, you also have more than 10 years editing experience in print journalism. So I want to get into your background. But yeah. you know, and by the way, uh, uh, Emily's website is epodcastproductions.com. 
and the story behind podcast.com. Of course, those links will be in the show notes. Um, we got to do the speed round, Emily. I mean, we need to know in, I don't know, maybe 60 seconds or less. Let's see how quick you can do it. We need to know everything about you. What mic you're like in a typical episode setup, what mic you're using, where it's plugged in, what interface, what software you're recording in, post production, how you're how you're tweaking it in post production, and then and up until you make the actual MP3 and upload it to the to your media host. So ready? Cool. All right. Okay, go. All right, so I record into an ATR twenty one hundred, one of the best mics on the market. Um, it's never let me down for three years, and it goes to Reaper, which I record into, which is my DAW and my editing software that I love so much. From there, I take the raw audio file. I put it through Auphonic to level everything and do some noise reduction, but I have moving curtains up, so I have pretty good raw sound anyway. As soon as it's through Auphonic, I bring it in. I have a template for my show in Reaper with some of the theme music and the intro and the outro, and then I put... Everything through Isotope RX6. I use Deplosive. I use Deep Mouth Click. That goes on every single thing. And because my S's whistle, which is why I have not only a pop filter, but also a windscreen on my microphone, but I also run it through DSer in Isotope. And from there, I edit it and make it sound good, take out all the mistakes. And because I've been doing it for so long, I've started adding bloopers at the end because sometimes I just laugh at myself. I heard the bloopers in a, in well in a, in in your show and it's it that's a great idea that's a great and th- how long does that take you to actually isolate the bloopers and then put them at the end cuz I I would think like a normal person would think oh that's easy just cut a put some bloopers at the end but it probably takes a little bit of time right It does and it doesn't in Reaper and also the shortcuts I have in Reaper, it's very easy to move something to another track. So I have a key to do that. So as soon as I select a blooper, I'll move it to another track that's just for bloopers and it's muted. So in case I forget to move it back, you know, it doesn't show up on the final recording. So once it's moved there and at the very end, if I have enough time or if I still feel up to it, because, you know, by the end of editing, sometimes you have all these great plans. But by the end, you're just like, I'm just ready to press publish. I'm done. But I'll move those to the bloopers. I'll put in the little uh, there's kind of a white noise sound and then some blooper beeps. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, uh, I'm so. And and so this is what happens when I invite people on the show. I like there's certain people that I don't know that I make them fill out this form, like what 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 equipment do you have? What software do you use? Like I ask him a bunch of questions because I need to know. I mean, I've had people on this show who literally said, I just plug in an ATR and record and I don't even do my own post-production. And I, to, in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, why are, why are you on this show? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's the other thing is I do have my ATR 2100 plugged via USB into my computer for a long time. I had an interface and the interface, it was just me doing a solo show. I didn't really need the interface. And sometimes it would add some buzz or I couldn't get a good volume on it. I yep. was like, you know what? Let's just eliminate that middleman. This sounds good. I also have a music bed, which also means I could be a little bit lazy with editing. So with my clients, I take out loud breaths and everything. Cause if you run something through a phonic, you get louder breaths. So with them, I take out their loud breaths, but because I have a music bed under my show, I don't have to take out as many of those. Or even though I run mouth de click, there are still some clicks in there. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. Like, look, if you're just one mic into a computer, then yeah, yeah. why bother having an interface? Because it just will cause problems. <laughs> exactly. Well, I liked my interface. It was a Tascam, I want to say 1200. Um, and it has four inputs. And it helped with my husband's band. My husband had a band and he uh, did all the stuff. So when I wanted to start a podcast, he was like, oh, I have all this stuff already. And it was really nice. And he's so techy. And he wants to sort of make things more complicated for me sometimes, even though I'm just like, I have a microphone. I have a really great microphone that can go right into the computer. <laughs> well, you know, audio toys and and oh, playing yes. around with audio toys is a it's an addiction. Um, <laughs> yes. I got a, a, a Rodecaster Pro upstairs that I'm ready. My husband's just like aching to unbox it, and I'm like, no, no, I have to make a video of this. This is actually for work, and he's like, but I want to play with it so bad. <laughs> oh wow, that's funny. Yeah. Wow. So you so you are going to switch over to the Rodecaster Pro. I don't know. I have it to try out and I don't know if I have to send it back. I kind of, I'm afraid to get addicted to it. I'm afraid of having those buttons just right there. Right. Yeah. To play the clips and, and also mm-hmm. um, some of the processing. And I, 
I'm intrigued by it. I still have never seen one and obviously haven't played with it. And But I'm really curious about the quality of the mic preamps. People are saying they're pretty good, but um, I'd like to hear them for myself. And I don't know when yeah. that'll ever happen. But, but here's the thing, though. I know they're at least good or very good like they're not bad right they're clearly right. not going to be bad mic pre's they're going to be good if not very if not a little better than good but i don't know if they're on the par of you know they're probably not on the par of like a sound devices mix pre-6 um or a higher end um interface for the mic well they also sent me the pod mic to try with it and supposedly they kind of go together really nicely uh, so i'm looking forward to that and they kept saying they're like it's so easy to set up and that's what i've heard from other people and i'm like we'll see about that all right if it passes my test of just like if i have to call my husband for anything then it doesn't pass my test no <laughs> that's a great test i love that and actually while well, everyone knows barry's here with me he's he's off camera um so we're <laughs> where we'll use the squad cast and the reason yeah. is, I haven't used Squadcast in a while. The reason is because the last two days with Zencaster, there's been major problems and also p pitching up voices, pitching down voices. Oh, oh man, I got to no. call. <clears throat> yeah, it's like weird stuff happening on Zencaster. And uh, look, every now and then, each one of these platforms does something quirky and, yeah. and weird. Uh, so whatever. But anyway, I thought, hey, I'll just try Squadcast. So we're actually we can see each other. But I actually I'm not looking at the Squadcast tab because I'm looking at my notes, Emily. So that's why it's like I'm not. Yeah, it might not seem like I'm looking right at you and whatever. But because uh, I don't I don't usually see my guests on video. It's a <laughs> audio only. And I'm like, wow, there's there she is. <laughs> Well, the nice thing is my husband pays for super fast internet and I'm hardwired in, which is so important. I take it for granted just because I've always been hardwired in. We've always had very fast internet. It's not for work. It's for his video games. Let's be honest here. Nice. But it helps out a lot when I'm broadcasting with other people. Right. So anyway, back to Barry is here with me. And Barry, do you would you ever consider switching over from the, your current mic to the, the Rode pod mic? What is it? The pod mic? Pod mic, yep. Yeah, Barry, would you ever consider switching? No way. You crazy? Oh, really? All right. <laughs> um, what do you, did you try the pod mic? When you tried the pod mic, what did you what did you hear? There's no activity, no giggle, no nothing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's an interesting review of a microphone. Okay, so, and I just drank some tea before recording, so I'm a little bit phlegmy, and I also started doing this intermittent fasting where you yeah yeah i do that i've been i lost 40 pounds last year doing that holy crap what do you do eight yeah. hour eating window eight and six, hours yeah yes and i eat crap i want everyone to know you can go through the drive through and do intermittent fasting and lose weight it's that's the best. that's what they told me <laughs> on these youtube videos i've been watching the guy's like look you yes. can either choose when you're gonna eat what like one it matters when you're gonna eat or what you're gonna eat only one matters. So if you if yeah. you restrict when you eat, then you can eat anything. And the other thing with it is it naturally sort of helps your hunger and makes you choose something better. So by the time my window opens, so my window opens in an hour, I'm already craving like, I want something fresh and cold and maybe a fruit or something. Instead, I would be like, oh, breakfast, blah, whatever. I'll eat a <laughs> granola bar and then go to go to the drive through. And for a long time, the first week, the first week or two of doing intermittent fasting, you're like, I, I don't believe this works, but I'll try it. And I ate crap and I still lost weight. And then your body starts regulating to be like, OK, now let's work on when you're really hungry versus when you think you're hungry. <laughs> This is so cool. This might this is going to end up being my favorite episode ever cuz first of all, we're talking about intermittent fasting and then and then we're going to talk about Reaper cuz you do everything in Reaper. I do. I love Reaper. I love it. So, before I forget, how do you can you zoom in when you're in Reaper and you're doing detailed editing and you want to take out like a little like a mouth click or something or something really tiny? Are you able to like make the track big enough and, and sort oh, of yeah. zoom in and see it? Oh, so easily. And that's what I love about it. Whenever I've gone back to Audacity and I lose that ability on my mouse to just scroll to zoom in, I, I get lost. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go up to the actual button and press it. So I would love to see 
like if you could make a little video just demonstrating what you do in Reaper and how you do it, I would love to see that. And the other thing is the ripple edit, ripple deleting, ripple editing, yeah. which is so when you do the ripple delete, how do you highlight? Like, do you have to go up to that bar along the top to highlight the entire section, or can you somehow? Because because my the the hang up I have with the ripple delete is I'm not sure how to highlight the actual piece that I want to remove because you can't click on the track and do it. So you can click right. on a track that doesn't have an audio there and do it. So how do you do that? So in Reaper, it's interesting going from Audacity to Reaper because I was with Audacity for a little over a year. And then my husband who had been using Reaper for his band start, was like, you know, you're recording in Reaper because your recording sounds better than it does in Audacity. Why don't you just edit in Reaper as well? And he kind of taught me and I took an afternoon and I learned the biggest thing to learn was instead of in Audacity where you can highlight something and delete it, you actually put split marks on either side of what you want to take out highlight that and then delete it. And with ripple editing, which automatically moves the track, sort of snaps it together when you take something out. Right. With ripple editing, there are three different um, configurations in Reaper. There's the one where it doesn't affect anything. So when you take something out, nothing moves. There's one where it's the track only. So it will only affect, affect whatever track you're working with. And then there's one where it's ripple all and it affects everything. So I have to watch out for that on my show because I have a music bed. So if I'm editing and I take something out, I have to watch out for that music track that I didn't split that and move that over. So right. it really helps having the different ripple editing either by track or ripple all or ripple none. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So you just described an interesting scenario. So let's say you have intro music going and you're mm -hmm. doing your intro and you mess up and you want to ripple delete that out and move all the tracks to the over. But but if there's music playing, you don't want to ripple delete the music because then they'll be like, <laughs> like the music will skip like an old record or something. So, yeah. 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 Well, and the other nice thing about Reaper is it's non-destructive. So sometimes if I want everything else to shift over, I can move that music track. I can kind of shorten it so that it doesn't get affected when I split something and delete it and then move it back out once I've deleted everything and everything's moved over and I can move it back out. And that's why I know that some editors are like, oh, non-destructive doesn't matter. It matters to me, actually. Oh, my God, it does. Wow. I are know. you kidding? It's vital. <laughs> and that's a great trick, by the way. So what, what Emily's saying there, everybody, is like, let's say you have a one-minute music intro music under under the host who's talking if you want to like ripple edit the host in that one minute all you do is you take that one minute music file and just drag drag the right side of it over all the way to the left you can make that a one like then you can make it look like it's only one second long yeah let's say and then you do your edits and then you just grab it again and 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 widen it to the minute which it was. It's yeah. right back where it was. <laughs> and one of the greatest things about Reaper and making templates for all my clients and also for me is putting markers in of just like, here's where I start talking. Here's where the music comes in. And those come in with every single template. So it's just snap to the grid. As soon, and it has a snap to the grid button you can press. So if you pull something in, it can snap right to that marker line. That's interesting. Yeah. I never, I never set, I never really use markers, um, but that's interesting. You could set markers for different, parts of the episode and then bring in audio and snap right to the marker. Yeah. And depending on the DAW, actually, I've seen it where I've opened a Reaper file in Audacity and the markers are still there. Huh. Yeah. Wait, how did you open a Reaper file in Audacity? <laughs> if it's a wave, I'll export it as oh, a wave and then open it the in Audacity. Yeah. 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 Not the Reaper session file, the the actual no. audio resulting no. audio file. Yeah. The mix. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Well, this I um, I want to see. Em, seriously, Emily, I've been looking yeah. for this for years. I want to see someone, and maybe you can do this. I want to see someone in Reaper, editing out like little tiny mouth clicks, or like, um, like if there's a space like between the question and answer. Let's say there's a five second space, and you want to quickly oh, yeah. tighten it up to three seconds. If you can do that like fast, because when I do that, I do it in my detailed editor and it's it's just a, either a stereo or mono track or file. And I mm -hmm. in, in a detailed editor, you can just take out mouth clicks and you could it's 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 amazing how fast you can edit. And the only reason yeah. I've never tried to do it in Reapers because I don't 
I don't know if you can do that quickly, but if you can, I want to see it. Yeah, you have to get um, the finger stance is what I call it is, you know how when you're editing, your fingers have a specific spot on the keyboard for your shortcuts. Yes. It's the S and the D and the space for me, the space plays, the S makes the split and the D deletes it. So you should see my fingers like they're constantly in this um, sort of configuration that looks like a claw almost. (laughs) Wow. Don't get too close to Emily when she's editing. She might just, you know, claw you. I will. I'll Let's... SD space your butt. <laughs> <laughs> She'll split your forehead. All I'll right. split, delete, and keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Making you sound like a Black Widow or something. I know. That may have to go on a t-shirt. Like, I will SD space your butt. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. Aren't you doing something? Isn't there like a women's editing club or something where you have... I thought you and Carrie might have been part of that or something where you're going to get together yeah. at Podcast Movement or something. Yeah, we got together at Podcast Movement. We realized um, it, there's something to be said for editing females who are still very kind of unsure about themselves on the mic as opposed to males who, if you ask a, a male, and I'm generalizing, and of course this isn't true in all cases, but sometimes if you ask a male what you do, I'm a doctor, I do surgery. If you ask a female, they might add the word just, and they'll say, oh, I'm just a doctor. I just cured someone's cancer. I just landed on the moon. And we talked about how sometimes with women, we take out those just when we're editing because it gives people more power in what they're saying. Nobody is just a mom. Being a mom is really hard. You don't say just a mom. Nobody is just, you know, a nine to five worker. You're helping right. somebody probably. You're working on something important that's to you, maybe important to you, maybe important to your boss, maybe important to other people, but there's no just when you're talking about yourself. So we call ourselves the just busters. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I saw that. I like that. I like that. Yeah. So, all right, so let's go through your speed round and pick through it a little bit more. Um, So I do see, because we're using Squadcast, I could see you on the screen. Yeah. And your ATR, your ATR is like kind of, is coming in from the side and pointed at your mouth, right? Yeah. So the reason I do that, my S's whistle, and which again is why I have the pop filter and the, um, the windscreen on. Right. And my S's whistle really hard. If I'm, speaking directly into it and you don't put a de on it at all it's like harsh yeah yeah harsh. Yeah. so i learned in college when i took a broadcast journalism class that i never thought i was going to use by the way i'm like i'm never going to do anything with audio this yeah, is a yeah, stupid yeah. class blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and i heard my my whistling s's for the first time and my professor was like oh you didn't know that and i was like oh are you kidding me yeah, <laughs> he's like oh yeah your s's whistle <laughs> right and he taught me that trick of just move the the mic to the side a little bit yes yeah, and it also for sibilance, um, yeah. which is the technical term for that. Um, it it really depends on the mic too. Like you yeah. can sort of mat like some mics just pick up more in that frequency range, which is usually about five to eight kilohertz or something. Uh, and it can be wider the, the can be a wider area of frequencies than that. Like maybe three to twelve kilohertz is the is the really large span of where the sibilance could be. Um, but yeah, the mic you choose makes a big difference. And so like the ATR2100, it's a good dynamic mic and it's it picks up, you know, it's a, it's a clear mic. It picks up a good yeah. amount of clarity, but it's it it's not um, like a condenser mic, which is going to pick up way more clarity and then even accentuate, probably accentuate the S's more depending on the mic. So mic choice I is remember- a big deal too. Yeah. I remember trying out a condenser mic and I had my headphones on and it was the first time I heard my whistling S's live. Normally I don't pick up on it as much, but I heard it through a microphone in my, oh, I should talk about my headphones, my Sony, I always have to look, MD7506s and they, they, oh, the first time I listened to any podcast through these, I just, oh my gosh how have i been listening any other way everything sounds so bright and <laughs> but then you can hear every single thing and i really heard my s's whistle when i got these headphones right yeah so the atr is a good a good mic for that and so you're pointing it in from the side which means yeah you're not speaking direct like like me if if people if, if you could see me i'm speaking into my re20 i'm speaking right into it from like an inch away and that's for me, that's how, and my voice, that's how I like to do it. 
And yeah. so, yeah, there's different ways uh, of doing it. Like I know, for instance, Dave Jackson, he has the RE320 and he kind of points it from the side on an angle, but he, he, he stays pretty close to the mic, maybe like three inches or so, which is, it's good. So yeah, you got to pick your mic and pick your, your setup and, and obviously stick with it. Right. Are you, you're probably pretty good about with microphone technique, like staying in the same place and all that. Right. I think I've gotten to the point where I don't notice my microphone anymore, but when I move away, it's almost like you, you're taking away my security blanket and I don't know what to do or like, I don't really talk. The only time I'll move away is when I laugh because like you, I have a nice loud laugh. So I throw my head back. And yes. I just laugh. <laughs> That's the classic maneuver. Ah, ha, ha. Yeah. Lean back. Yeah. All right. So your Sony MD7506 headphones, those are very popular. Um, now, do you... While you're recording, do you monitor pretty loud or do, or, or do you turn your headphones down? How do you? I turn my headphones down. I'm very conscious of how I feel when I've been editing for a long time and I have my headphones on because, again, these are really good headphones. So you don't actually want them to be so loud that when you take them off, it's you have a ringing. And I had that the first few months of editing for other people. And I realized or I looked at looked it up and there's such a thing as oral fatigue where your ears are actually really tired. So I keep them pretty low. I keep them just loud enough to hear. But with the ATR2100 plugged in via USB, unfortunately, you can't monitor yourself. Right. Which personally, I'm OK with. I I don't have to hear myself, but I know there are people out there who they need to hear themselves selves, and it needs to be loud. And I'm like, I just tell them, look, be careful, man, because if you're playing like, well, I guess if it's yourself, it's not. Well, you st still can feedback from your headphones back into the mic, but listening with uh, with your headphones at, at loud volumes while you're recording is never a good idea because there's going to be bleed into the mic. Okay, let's move on uh, to Reaper. I mean, let's talk a little bit more about Reaper. Yeah, I really love Reaper, and I really don't like when people on Facebook or social media, they, it's almost like they treat Reaper like it's a like a crappy... Like a step, yeah. like a stepchild of editing software. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, this little piece of crap free thing. It's like, do you... People do not understand. Reaper is one of the best DAWs, and it can yeah. do almost the most uh, out of any of them. And I, I probably, I've used it for uh, almost three years now. And I probably have only done maybe five to 10% of what Reaper is actually capable of. Exactly. I feel the same <laughs> way. Now, when you're in Reaper and you're like, we talked a little bit before about editing and, and ripple d deleting and stuff like that. Um, do you, what kind of plugins do you use, if any? Really, I have a Isotope RX six, and okay. that's that's it. And I love it. I can use it. I can either use it within Reaper, or I usually pull it out and use it in its own separate window, um, just because I like the interface a little bit. Nice, yeah. So there's uh, well, there's an EQ in there. Yep. There's, there's EQ. Um, and I again, I run Deplosive and Demouth Click on everything I do, just because as soon as I saw that. Isotope had deplosive. I was like, this is going to pay for itself with some <laughs> with, with some of my clients who it's like, please get a pop filter. I don't like it. Please get a pop filter. Yeah. No. All right, fine. I'll get Isotope RX six, but my prices are going up, so all of you can pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plosives are nasty. Like I even like so in our in our regular in our TV room where we watch TV, we can also watch YouTube and how many YouTube videos that people make, they record it and there's nasty plosives all over the entire thing. It's like, and I have a subwoofer set up up there too. So it <laughs> it even <laughs> makes it punch a lot more. I mean, deep plosive is, again, for professional audio, you, you need it. I mean, yeah, it's not a question. Yeah. And when I first started editing for other people, I went through Steve Stewart's podcast editing course and he taught me how to fade into those plosives to take them out manually and then after a few months I got isotope and I got deplosive and I was like oh Steve you gotta see this <laughs> like <laughs> you you have no idea how much time this saves <laughs> yeah yeah Steve Stewart obviously frankly uh the podcast editors club on Facebook 
that group. Yep. He runs that. He also edits podcasts. He's also a podcast engineering school graduate. Yep. Wait, hold. On. I'm looking for. Uh... Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. He's also, I'm going to redo it. He's also, <laughs> but I'm not going to edit it out. He's also a podcast engineering school graduate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So, all right. So you're in Reaper. So sometimes you use the RX6 modules as plugins within Reaper. I like that. And then when you mix out of Reaper, uh, what do you normally mix mix down to? So I export everything well, when it's finished into an MP3 at 96 kilobits per second. For my show, because it's so short, it's not like I'm worried about taking up too much space on Libsyn, who's my hosting company. Uh, so I do the 96, but I've done 64 with other podcasts. And I've had clients who say, I don't have that much money to spend on hosting. So can you mix it down for me to 64? And I'm like, okay, it doesn't make that much of a difference, but sure, whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> So that and it's it's a it's mono you're talking about, right? Oh yeah, 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 mono. Yeah, 96 kbps mono, which is yeah, good cuz 64 is kind of like the standard, so 96 is even better. That's good. Yeah. And you mix it right in Reaper to an MP3. Yep. Yeah, um in Reaper you go to export render and just I think render. render yeah. Thank you. Ren render. I didn't have it open because I was worried about it freezing again. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, render and then um Okay, so then, so wow. Okay, so when you're in Reaper, though, you're not, do you, do you do any type of mastering step? Like, do you compress the entire episode or anything like that? Oh, wait, you send it to Alphonic. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's done in Alphonic. And the other thing is, I'm, I'm not really worried about Alphonic. I know that some editors are like, well, then you're not really editing your stuff. And for me... Alphonic does a lot of the leveling and it does a lot of the stuff for me, but I'm still listening to every single bit of it and I'm adjusting by hand what needs to be done. Like like those loud breaths I talked about where Alphonic loves bringing up any sort of breath at all, even if you're just just a tiny little bit and yeah. Alphonic wants to bring it up so loud. So actually in Reaper, going back to having separate tracks, I have a track underneath when I'm recording and I could, when anybody talks in any of the templates and it's just called bad breaths and it's not for somebody whose breath is stinky, <laughs> it's for breaths that are very loud. And um, so I'll select <laughs> that, that breath <laughs> and I'll move it down to that bad breath track um, with just a click of the button. That's actually the V key for me is moving it down. And it lowers it by 20 decibels and that makes it sound natural. Because if you've ever heard a podcast where all the breaths are taken out, it's it's almost uncanny valley like it's very unnatural. Spooky. So I like having a yeah, I like having a little bit of breaths in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. No breaths is spooky. It is. <laughs> You're like, what? No, this person isn't real. Yeah. It's like, what is this? A computer? What? A so wow, you you actually I love this idea. You have a separate track for bad breaths, and you you well when you highlight a clip in Reaper and you hit the the D key. When you hit the D key, it deletes it. So I have it set up. When I have a selection selected, when right. I split something and have that selected, if I press the V key, it automatically moves it down one track. Um, on the number pad, I think it's the number two, and then eight will move something back up a track. So it makes it really easy for me to move things where I need to. I use that V key for the outtakes too. I'll press it twice and that's the outtake track. It'll move it down two tracks to the oh, outtake track. Oh, that yeah. is cool. Yeah, and what's yeah. cool about moving it down a track is that like if you were to do that manually, there's always the the uh, the risk of like not only moving it down, but slightly moving it right or left without knowing it. Yes. <laughs> yes. For for about three weeks when I realized I wanted to start doing this and moving it down to a track, I was doing it manually. And I was like, there has to be a keyboard shortcut. And I will sit there and find the keyboard shortcut. I will take 30 minutes to make a keyboard shortcut <laughs> just to save myself maybe 30 minutes over the course of, I don't know, two years. But I'll still think it's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> Yeah, I created a couple keyboard shortcuts for Reaper for myself. Uh, and when I went in to do that, and you look at how many uh, processes yes. you can you can do with one keystroke or, or even a series of key, like, you know, hold down this and hit that. Um, it's mind boggling. 
It is. And I used to have a gamer mouse. My husband set me up with a gamer mouse and it had a lot of extra buttons on it that you could program. So I programmed them all, but then I found myself really using the keyboard shortcuts a lot more. So when that mouse started dying, I was like, just get me a regular mouse because I never used those buttons. I had high hopes, but really I have my claw hand going on and I'm all set. That's cool. And I don't know, Jason DeFilippo, when he was on this show, he actually has a mouse in his right hand and he has this other little trackball with some buttons on his left hand. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, the trackball thing is so awesome. But one thing I found, because I have a trackpad on my laptop and I, I learned very quickly, oh, no, if I'm editing on the go, I have to bring a mouse with me. And I ended up getting a laptop tray, which is just, oh, it's my favorite thing. It pulls out so that you have a little area for your mouse on the side. So when I'm editing on the train or on my lap, I can use my mouse to edit. Oh, I'm so happy. Wow. Wait, what is yeah. it? A little thing that pulls out from the side of what? I'll see if I have it actually. It's it's just a laptop tray. You put your laptop on it. It kind of keeps your laptop cooler. Oh, and I see. inside it, it has a tray that you pull out and you can pull it out to either side to act as sort of a place to put your mouse. Actually, oh, back. that is cool. Yeah. It's a, okay. A laptop tray that keeps it cool. Okay. I missed that. I think I was making a note or something. Um, that's cool. Okay. So you're sending yeah. it to Alphonic then. Well, wait a minute. You're sending an MP3 to Alphonic? No, no, no. I record and I export it as a wave and I put the wave through Alphonic. MP3 doesn't come till the very end for me. Oh, so Alphonic comes before Reaper. Yeah. Yeah. I record in Reaper and then I put it through Alphonic. But yeah, here's the laptop tray. Oh, you're and- going to show me on this... Yep, and you pull it out. Oh, all right. I see. Yeah, it's oh, a little yeah. tray with a little slider that slides out on each side. Yeah. So you're listening to this, you won't be able to see that, but it, you won't. But it's cool. It's simple, and you, I, it, you know, you, you can know what it is by just how we yeah, explained it. Yeah, it's twenty bucks, but totally worth it if you're a podcast editor and you edit on the go and you don't always have a nice big table to work with. So something like a plane tray or a train tray, I found that this is really useful to give you just a few extra inches for your mouse. Cool. All right, so when you so you record it in Reaper, but then you take the raw files and put you put each one separately through Alphonic? Well, just because it's a solo show, um, I can just record on one track. I get that wave of just just my voice. I don't use the do the music or anything. I put my voice through Alphonic and then I pull it into Reaper into the template for the story behind which already has the music and is already leveled and everything. And I have the track set up. So when I add other music, it's already, um, there's already a limiter on that music. So it never gets too loud. It's exactly the okay. the volume that I want the music to be. And, and I think I have, I think I have a limiter on my track as well in the template. Okay. So, so in off phonic though, let's just quickly, you said mm-hmm. you do some leveling and noise reduction. Um, I think I do the high pass filter too. Yeah, I have the high pass filter, the adaptive leveler, the noise and hum reduction, and I have negative 16 luffs, which I know is is controversial. I don't know if controversial is the right word, but people have their preferences for it. But I know that when I put it at negative 16 luffs, it will match my GPS on my phone. So when I'm listening to a podcast in my phone and I'm also following directions, I don't want that big difference between turn left and then the podcast is really quiet. Like, <laughs> Right. So, but wait, so your track is a mono track and you're, mm-hmm. you're really leveling it to minus 16 luffs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because that's about, as, th- that's about three luffs louder than the so-called standard. I know, but the so-called standard doesn't match up with my GPS, which is so important for me. <laughs> well, it's a, that's a great point, actually. So maybe that's why like Spotify and Amazon, maybe that's why they're boosting everybody up two luffs as well. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that too with them when I listen to them and I have my GPS going. And it was funny, about two years ago when Pokemon Go, when that craze came about, I would play Pokemon Go while listening to podcasts and podcasts would always be so much quieter because they'd all be at ni- negative 19. Yeah. And I think the game itself, even if you turn down the volume, it still wouldn't match up. It was very hard to get a good level between the two. So I couldn't do both at the same time. <laughs> See, this is... I, I think I'm going to make an official announcement here in in the in the world of podcasting. I think we're entering the the loudness wars. 
<laughs> I don't want to enter the loudness wars. That's the thing. I don't necessarily <laughs> mind moving the the volume, but I have, but I did when I was really into Pokemon Go and playing. I was like, oh, there are certain podcasts that need. That <laughs> I can't. I can't play right now. <laughs> you know, Brad Hargis and Bandrew Scott both put out their shows. They're in stereo, but they put them out at minus fifteen. So that's mm-hmm. one basically one luff louder than the so-called standard. I put mine out at the so-called standard, but recently because I, you know, um, Spotify and Amazon, they if it's a stereo podcast, they'll boost it up to minus fourteen, which is even louder. They, and I was they like, want it louder. and I was like, so what I did the like yesterday. I think I took one of my episodes, I brought it into RX seven, and I processed it to be minus fourteen luffs. And just to see, just because I wanted to see what that looks like, right? And sure enough, I compress and master my show pretty well. I mean, my show doesn't have these wild spikes, and my show is a, it's a nice tight mix of a show um, in general. You know what I mean? So when I brought it up to minus 14 luffs, still, though, a lot of the peaks were getting chopped off. And now, look, RX-7, it doesn't just chop off the peaks and so it's distorted. It it limits the peaks, and so you you don't even hear it, right? You, it sounds right. perfectly fine, but you can tell where the the peak. It's you can tell where it's literally limiting all the peaks to to make it that loud. Um, and I don't know. I was I was a little. I, I wouldn't say shocked, but I didn't think it would it would like I didn't think minus fourteen would would cut off that many peaks, but that's pretty loud. It it is loud, but the other thing is, and I know that. Um, Rob Walls has talked about on the feed where not everyone's listening through smart speakers, but I'm one of the few who listen to podcasts through smart speakers now because we have a whole, our home is basically owned by Google. Um, If my husband had his way, we just have Google Homes in every single room pretty much. And so I listen to podcasts through that while I'm cooking and I'll also listen to music. So it's really nice to have podcasts that are consistent with that volume that the music is already going to be on. So I don't have to adjust the volume all the time on those smart speakers. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, but you with, with your, so I, you know what I, now I really want to download one of your MP3s of your episodes and, 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 and see and look at it, how, how, <laughs> what the luffs is. Because yeah. if your voice is at minus 16, it's mono. Minus 16 at mono. That's even one louder than Spotify and Amazon. And that's even without adding the music. Because when you're talking over the music, it's probably going to like even one or two luffs louder for momentarily. Which, yeah. anyway, it, here's the thing. There's no right or wrong, obviously. Right. Frankly. And I'd, I'd honestly rather have it Louder, almost. I'd rather sure. have a podcast be louder than and have somebody have to turn it down than having to turn a podcast all the way up. Because have you done that in your car where you turn a, the podcast all the way up and you're just like, oh my gosh, it's at right. 30 maybe. And you hear just all the hiss, like all the hiss that could ever have been hissed from your phone, from your, <laughs> from your car. <laughs> yeah. Hiss on top of hiss on top of hiss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is, I agree with you. I agree. Because because look, it's mostly spoken word. So there's, yeah, having it louder is not a problem. The loudness wars in music was different because the loudness wars in music, see, music is, a, a lot of music sounds better when it's more dynamic, right? It gets softer yeah. and then louder and it's, it's, it's like a, it's a, an experience, right? It is. But yeah. podcasts, pe- two people talking or three people talking, it's not, I mean, it, it's actually better if it's more compressed because it holds everybody's level tighter together and it's more understandable, so. But there are some really cool experiences that you can create with podcasting with theater of the mind, anybody who does audio drama and they get the stereo effect. Oh, my goodness. And I always feel bad because I'll listen to these in the car and I know that they've put all this work into it and I should really be listening on my really good headphones so I can hear just how they use certain sound effects, where the sound effects are coming from, if they split the stereo and put something on one on one side. Oh my gosh, I love that. And I appreciate it so much. And I, so, I, so I feel bad when, you know, I'm like, nope, everything in mono for me. I'm not even going to bop now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. But yeah. I, I am I am one of the guys who, I, or I am one of the people who I do appreciate stereo. And I, yeah, eat, just because of my intro music, I my show is stereo. So, yeah. Yeah. I like when people have really good 
intro music that is in stereo. So when I do hear it, and I don't even have my intro music in stereo just because it's not, I don't know, I didn't really think about music as much. I knew I wanted a music bed and I was like, yeah, I like this track. This is fine. I'll put it as my intro. And now just from listening to more music in these headphones, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I could have done so much more with my music. <laughs> right. Well, there's always the future and and yeah. well, and then there's always the the time commitment to it. Like how you know how much time do we have to produce our shows? That yeah, that's another factor to take into account. Because even though my show is five to ten minutes, it still takes about four hours to research and write. And I I feel bad when everyone's like, I want it to be longer, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, I'm so sorry. The eight minutes is all I could do. <laughs> right, but but what a great uh, feeling to leave your listener with, right? Oh, yeah. I want it to be longer. That's that's exactly what you want. You want them wanting more. Yeah, until they leave a bad review about that. And I feel terrible. They're just like, it's only four stars because it's not long enough. And I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what? Okay. Yeah. I mean, God. And I want to be like, hey, there's hardcore history. There's an audiobook for you. <laughs> I mean, pop, <laughs> like, a lot of people, a lot of people in general are complete idiots. And it's yeah. just terrible. And that's why this whole social media thing and all this is, is blowing up and it's, it's corrupting and basically ruining society because every jackass is just an idiot. And so, yeah, I mean, as, as true professionals and content creators, unfortunately we have to deal with those idiots and that's just how it is. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, come on, yeah, really? The guy loves your their... podcast, but only cause it's not long enough left you four star. I, I mean, come but... on. I can't even fault them for that because I know how annoying it is to go in and leave a review. So I'm so very grateful that they took the time to do that. So I have to put that into perspective of like, okay, this one part isn't for them. I'm not necessarily going to change it, but I do appreciate that they did leave a review and that they took the time to go through the app because it's not easy. It's not as easy as it used to be to leave a review for podcasts anymore. There's like, mm. well, you have to go to the show, uh, but not in your actual subscribe button. You have to go to it outside. Like you have to search for it and then you have to press the button to write a review. And it's just no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But and good for them for leaving a review. So that's really nice. Yeah. And that's also never my call to action because I know how much, you know, how much time it takes to leave a review. I mean, my call to action in the, in the podcast is usually, hey, I have a book. If you right. like the podcast, buy the book. Yeah, yeah. So reviews are always appreciated, but never asked for. Yeah, I looked at mine like three months ago and I and, and there was one that was a one star. I tweeted about it too, or I put it on Facebook too, but like one person gave gave my, my whole show the worst rating ever. What is it? One star, right? And yeah. because she didn't like the one guest, she's like, oh, that guest doesn't know what she's oh. talking about. And it's like, really? OK, thank you. Like and then I then oh. I'm like, you know what? I don't. Why do I look at this crap? Like, no, you, you don't. You don't look at it. Yeah, I don't want I don't, don't. want to look at my reviews anymore. I don't care. You don't. You I'm, like remember, you. Though, yeah, I'm like you. I'm like you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> those who mind don't matter. Those who matter don't mind. So you just got to go with that. Yeah, and my show is supporting my school. And as long as I have students yes. signing up for my school, I don't really care <laughs> about anything else. Yeah, and I think that that has to be said for editors as well. Finding clients is like if you put yourself out there and somebody doesn't like you, you probably don't want to work with that person anyway. You can't get them to like you because you probably don't want their money. You don't want them as a client. They're really, they're going to be annoying to you. So just let themselves weave, weed themselves out and move on. Totally. All right. So last thing before we go, uh, you said you have some curtains up I there did. in your room. So t tell me about that setup. Yeah. So I have moving blankets all around my desk. Um, I, I loved just how easy it was to record and get very clean raw audio with the moving blankets around my desk. But the problem is moving blankets are really ugly. <laughs> and trust me, I have searched for pretty moving blankets. They don't exist. So by the way, Sweetwater, if you're listening, this is what I'm looking for on your website. Pretty moving curtains. That's that's what I'd like. But so I have moving curtains up and I put Christmas lights, kind of twinkle lights on top of them. And then over that, I put white shears. So it just looks like this ethereal, I'm I'm living in a cloud type thing going on. And I have a nice shelf and a setup for when I go on video, which I don't do too often, which is weird. And my husband's just like, 
you you made that nice setup and you barely go on video, but <laughs> it's for me. Yeah. Well, it's for you and it it is so even those extra that extra layer. What did you call it? A white shear? Yeah, it's just white shears from IKEA that go over windows and I got a few of them and just put them over my moving blankets. We actually have hooks. I'm in my basement, so we have exposed beams on the ceiling and we were able to put giant hooks and it's easy enough to put a hole into the moving blanket. And then with the shears, they already have the holes, so I stuck them over the hooks. I can always take it down if I need to. It's pretty temporary and pretty quick to put up and down if I needed to, but this is my space. It, it was so important for me to have dedicated space for podcasting. And especially when I got into editing of just, nope, I need this to be my little, my little space. Right. That's awesome. And I'm reminded of something I saw on your website, the epodcastproductions.com. There's a note on top. I love this, by the way. This is like, this is one of the best <laughs> things I've seen in a long time. There's a on top of your website. It says, "Note: I am at my capacity for new editing uh, show notes clients at, at the yes. moment. Strategy sessions are still available." I love that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that that was so cool to be able to put that up. But then you feel really <laughs> bad. The yeah. other thing is, I put that up anytime I take on a new client. I put that up automatically because I like taking on new clients one at a time. Because you start to get used to, you have to get used to their cadence, how they talk, and then you can work on their files quicker. Right. But when you're first getting started, it's like any new relationship. You're you're knowing their ins and outs. You're knowing you're getting to know their crutch words. You're getting to know what you're probably going to be working on. And that's also something I take note of when I do discovery calls with potential clients is I listen to how they talk. I ask them about their podcast to hear how they talk when they get really excited because hopefully they're excited about their podcast. Mm. And I listen to the crutch words they use and I'll make notes of, okay, this is what you're going to be working with. You're going to be working with a lot of you knows. You're going to be working with mouth clicks. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, and the nice thing is I can also sort of send them an email back and say, so here, here are the things that you might want to work on after I've worked with their files for a little bit. And then I usually take that banner down if I'm like, okay, I've gotten used to that client and now I can take on someone new. Well, it's funny. I went undercover, Emily, and I called. We talked about six months ago and you didn't know it was me. And uh, Barry, remember that? Yeah. And uh, and I and you <laughs> and and uh, I asked you afterwards, like, what did you think of my voice and my excitement and, and my mouth clicks and, and everything? Remember that, Barry? I asked her that. And what what did she say, Barry? It's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess. You told me I was a mess. So thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I was like, wait a minute. I don't remember this at all. <laughs> yes, of course, everyone. I'm just kidding. So Emily Prokop, <laughs> this has been awesome. The story behind, that's your show. I think everyone should go listen to it. Everyone should send you money. Everyone should send you chocolate and whatever <laughs> whatever else. I don't know. Um, if, if, if someone just tweets me pictures of their cat, I will be so happy and over the moon. I love when people show me their pets. <laughs> nice. And you're the author of the story behind as well. So everyone can yep. go on Amazon and, and find that, right? Yeah. Look up Emily Porkchop. It's fine. Oh, <laughs> it's like a, it's a good pseudonym, right? You should start writing yeah. under that name. <laughs> yeah. If you look up Emily Porkchop, the story behind still comes up. So <laughs> if you can't remember my last name. So that's awesome. And, you know, we didn't even get into your 10 years experience in print journalism. Yeah, and that well, that was all journalism, working on newspapers, magazines, um, it, weirdly never thinking that audio class would come in handy until 10 years later when, hey, I kind of want to start a podcast, I think. Right. But I'm sure you have also, in addition to all that, have a lot of insight into like scripting the content of podcasts like to be more coherent and to flow better and have a story or an arc or something. I don't know. Anyway, what we'll, we'll maybe get into that another, well, that doesn't really fit on this show, but if anyone, you know, would like to talk to Emily about that, you should, cause I'd like to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Dave Jackson, I think two years ago, um, interviewed me. So he has an episode. It's like journalism one Oh one for podcasters. And I go into a little bit of that. We talk about, uh, writing headlines. And that's important for when you're writing your episodes. Although now that I'm thinking about Apple's new no keyword stuffing thing, maybe that information is out of date. I'm not sure exactly what I said. I don't think I said, you know, stuff it with keywords, but. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, no, that that happened to everybody. That ha- everybody was saying, you know, put these, you know, this is what you can put in your title and your description, and then so it wasn't, you know, it. I think people know now that you can't do all that keyword stuffing yeah. stuff. So, all right, Emily Prokop, thank you. And well, before we're done, you know, you have to at the end, you have to yell something, and hopefully, you don't scare the rest of the people in your house. Uh, <laughs> but you have to yell, sound great. Okay. Are you up for that? I'm up for that. Are you you're willing? Oh, of course. And able? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. PodcastEngineeringSchool.com. We'll see you next time. All right. Until then, Emily, go. Sound great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, little extra grunting never hurt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you walk away from me with, and you can't play that possible with. Does it mean?